Yes, questions before we begin. I have no idea what fourth he was. Well, I will answer your questions. If you want some examples solved, I will solve them, and then I will start lecture. <coughs> okay, so there was a correction in this problem, by the way. I hope you didn't miss that correction. 4C. The question is this one. We have this electric field, which is Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, R minus D cosine theta, divided by r minus cube. <coughs> okay, first I had said it was written 3 over 2, but then I made another correction and corrected to cube. Minus r plus d cosine theta divided by r plus cube to the power r hat. <coughs> yes. And plus d sine theta over r minus cubed plus d cosine theta r plus cubed to the power theta hat. This is the electric field and you were supposed to find the corresponding charge distribution. <coughs> now to find the charge distribution you just take the divergence. <coughs> Divergence of the electric field, this is supposed to be equal to rho over epsilon zero. So let's first evaluate this. And of course you were given that this is true if theta is between zero and pi over two, and E is equal to zero if theta is larger than pi over two. This is the question. <coughs> so let's calculate the divergence of E. Now, the easiest one, the divergence of E is equal to zero if theta is larger than pi over two. Now, this is kind of trivial because E is zero, so its divergence is also zero. So there's, but if you plot the x, y, z plane, this region below the x, y axis is what we call the z, theta is equal to pi over two plane. So below the x, y plane, there are no charges. No electric field, no charges, etc. So the only problem is, <coughs> is there an electric charge above the xy plane? And is there an electric charge on the xy plane? So those are the things we have to check. First, let's look at above the xy plane. So if theta is less than pi over 2, what is the charge distribution? Is there a charge distribution? If theta is less than pi over 2. Now the divergence, if you look it up in uh, spherical coordinates, divergence of the electric field, you see we have the, both the radial and the theta components, there are no uh, phi component, and the divergence is one over r squared, del over del r, r squared er, the radial component, plus one over r sine theta, d over d theta, sine theta, and the theta component. This is the divergence of the electric field in spherical coordinates. There are no phi components. Now, what is the radial and the angular component, er? Well, I will ignore the q over 4 pi epsilon 0 for the time being. I am not going to write it down. <coughs> At the end, if necessary, we can just add it. This is r minus d cosine theta divided by r minus cube minus r plus d cosine theta, r plus cube, and the theta component is d sine theta divided by r minus cubed plus d cosine theta divided by r plus cube. Let's take the derivatives. <coughs> so the divergence of E is equal to 1 over r squared. Now, r squared er, if we take the derivative, it is 2r times er plus r squared. The derivative of er with respect to r. 
Well, both R minus and R plus depend on R also. We ha that is something we have to keep in mind. So if we take the derivative with respect to R, uh, first, the derivative of the numerator is, the, I'm taking the derivative of the first one, the derivative of the numerator is one, one over R minus cubed, and plus numerator R minus D cosine theta, times the derivative of one over R minus cubed, which will be minus three over R minus to the four dr minus by dr. So this is the derivative of the first term. Minus, let's take the derivative of the second term. I will just repeat the same thing. It's, it looks almost uh, the same. One over r plus cubed minus r plus d cosine theta minus 3 over r plus to the 4 dr plus by dr. This is the first term in the divergence. Let's look at the second term in the divergence. Plus 1 over r <coughs> sine theta d by d theta. Let's take the derivative. Cosine theta e theta plus sine theta times the derivative of <coughs> e theta with respect to theta. It is d cosine theta divided by r minus cube plus d sine theta minus 3 over r minus to the 4 dr minus by d theta plus minus d sine theta over r plus cube plus d cos cosine theta minus 3 r plus to the 4 times dr plus by d theta. Well, then you have to make the simplifications, deriv derivatives, etc., and you will see that this is equal to zero. Can you repeat again what's R minus and R plus? Well, R minus and plus are square root of R squared plus D squared plus or minus 2RD cosine theta. So if you take the derivative of r plus or minus with respect to r, this is nothing but r plus or minus d cosine theta divided by r plus or minus. And derivative of r plus or minus with respect to theta, this is nothing but uh, minus or plus r d sine theta. divided by r plus or minus. <coughs> well, to simple, if you want to simplify it a bit, so there is a way to simplify it. Let's take this one. Now let's see. We have this r minus d cosine theta divided by r minus cube. But you see r minus d cosine theta is nothing but the derivative of r minus. So this is in fact nothing but minus the derivative with respect to r of 1 over r minus. Because if you take the derivative of uh, 1 over r minus, with respect to r, what you get is, okay, you get a minus one. That is why I have this minus over here, minus derivative of r minus divided by r squared, r minus squared. Well, the derivative of r minus is nothing but r minus d cosine theta divided by r minus. And <clears throat> so the, e, the electric field, you can actually write it as q over four pi epsilon zero 
minus d over dr, 1 over r minus, minus 1 over r plus in the r hat direction. You see? And then we have, you see here we have d sine theta over r minus cube or d cosine theta over r plus cube. Well, it's sine theta and, well, let's see if, no, these are both sine theta, I wrote it wrong. Now in the question, these are bo both sine theta. This is sine theta, so this is cosine, uh, no, this is sine theta. This is cosine theta plus this is sine theta. Now this d sine theta and d cosine theta, you can just as well write them as the derivative with respect to theta. 1 over r, 1 over r minus minus 1 over r plus in the theta hat direction. So this will kind of simplify your derivations. And in fact, if you just write it down, this is minus the divergence of q over 4 pi epsilon 0 gradient of 1 over r minus minus 1 over r plus. So this is the potential of two charges, one at the pole. <coughs> now, <coughs> let's, let's look at this r minus and r plus. A bit in, let's take their square. This is r, r squared plus d squared plus or minus 2rd cosine theta, which is r plus or minus, let's, let's, I will define this vector d squared, where this d squared, d vector, is nothing but d in the z direction. So basically you have two charges, one at plus d, the other one at minus d. Well, it's not the dipole. You see, dipole has an electric field everywhere, but it looks like a dipole above the xy plane. So, okay, you, you can just do the, these derivatives over here and see that the divergence is zero. So that will basically tell you that there are no charges above the xy plane, but there is one catch. You see, above the xy plane, it is possible for r minus to be zero. You see, above the, theta is equal to zero is in the xy plane, above the xy plane. So for theta is equal to zero, r minus, which is r squared plus d squared minus two rd, which is square root of r minus d squared, r minus d. This can be zero above the xy plane. Do you see? Well, if it is uh, zero above the xy plane, the electric field diverges. It is singular there. Now, here we had, I mean, we didn't show it, but you were supposed to show, just take the derivatives, etc., that and show that the divergence is zero but you can take derivatives only at points where your functions are not singular. So the divergence of E is zero everywhere above the xy plane, except at the point theta is equal to zero and r is equal to d. Except then there, divergence of E is zero above the xy plane, so that basically proves that above the xy plane, there are no charges except and possibly at the r is equal to d. Now, how to find whether there is a charge at r is equal to d? Take the electric field, integrate it over a small sphere, 
around the point around this point. And then you should see whether it goes to zero as the size of the sphere goes to zero or not. If there are no charges above the xy plane anywhere, then this integral should be zero. But you will see that this integral, you should have, I mean, if you calculate it, you should see that this integral is not zero. And in fact, its value is independent of the size of the sphere. And you should obtain q over epsilon zero for this surface integral. This kind of proves that at this point, there is a charge q. And so we know that there are no charges above the xy plane except on the point dz hat. And there is a charge q at that point. So above xy plane, rho is nothing but q Dirac delta, the three-dimensional Dirac delta, r minus dz hat. So this is above the xy plane. Uh, there were several ways to see it. You could just take this, uh, uh, this, evaluate this divergence, show that it is zero, and then you should pay attention to the fact that r minus r plus cannot be zero above the xy plane. R plus becomes zero below the xy plane, but this electric field is valid only above the xy plane. So the only place where it has a singularity is at this point, and to see whether there is a charge at that point or not, you can just take a very small sphere around that point, integrate the electric field over that sphere, the surface of the sphere, and show that it is non-zero. So this would prove that there is a charge Q at that point. So you basically, now we know the, the charge distribution below the xy plane, which is zero, and we also know the charge distribution above the xy plane, which is this Dirac delta. The only thing left is what is the charge distribution on the xy plane. So that is the last thing we have to do. Well, the xy plane is a surface. So if there is a charge on the xy plane, it has to be a surface charge. It cannot be a volume charge. And we know that for surface charges, the electric field at the top of the surface minus the electric field at the bottom of the surface, this is equal to the surface charge density divided by epsilon zero times this unit vector pointing from the bottom of the surface to the top of the surface. So this is what we will use. Now this is again our electric field. Now the top of the surface, in fact top or the bottom of the surface, is defined by theta is equal to Theta goes to pi over 2. If we are on the top, then theta goes to pi over 2 by taking values smaller than pi over 2. If we are at the bottom, theta goes to pi over 2 by taking values larger than pi over 2. So if theta is pi over 2, r plus or minus, which were defined as r squared plus d squared plus or minus 2rd cosine theta, now, as theta goes to pi over 2, whether above or below, cosine theta just becomes 1. So this is equal to square root of r squared plus d squared plus or minus 2rd. It goes to, let's say, which is square root of r plus or minus d squared, which is r plus or minus the absolute value. Cosine pi over 2 is 0. You are right. So r plus and r minus, they both take this value on the xy plane. Now, the electric field at the bottom well, if we are at the bottom of the surface, that is, theta goes to pi over 2 by taking values larger than pi over 2, but we know that that is 0. The electric field at below the xy plane were given to be 0. 
You see, this was the definition of our electric field. So above the, if theta is, theta goes to pi over two by taking values larger than pi over two, the electric field is zero. If theta goes to pi over two by taking values below pi over two, this is what we have. Now, you see, if you look at the first term, the radial component, theta is pi over two. Cosine pi over two is zero, so cosine terms, they just cancel. They, they just go away. R minus and R plus, they are equal when theta is pi over two. We have a, this minus sign, so the radial part, radial term, it just disappears. There is no radial component of the electric field. The only component is the horizontal component, the theta hat component, sorry. So this is the E top. Of course, we have to evaluate it, this at theta is equal to pi over two. This is equal to Q over four pi epsilon zero. Cosine theta is zero. R minus and R plus, they are equal to each other. So the first term just goes to zero. The second term, okay, let me correct this. This is sine theta. Sine of pi over two is one. So we have d twice d, both terms that will turn out to be equal, divided by r squared plus d squared in the theta hat direction. Now, so e top minus e bottom Well, e bottom is zero, this is e top, this is equal to, let's cancel these two, q over two pi epsilon zero, d over square root of r squared plus d squared in the theta hat direction, and this should be equal to sigma over epsilon zero in the n hat direction. Now the only thing left is to identify this theta hat, what is this theta hat direction? Now let me just draw the y and the z axis. X axis is pointing out of the screen. <clears throat> if you remember how we define theta hat, theta hat is the direction in which theta is increasing. That's why basically we call it theta hat. And all other uh, values staying the same. So we are on the x, y plane, so let's say we are somewhere at this point. Theta increases in which direction? Remember, theta is this angle, so if you take an arbitrary point, this is the theta. So at this point, I don't want to increase r, I don't want to increase phi, I only want to increase theta. So what is the direction in which only theta increases at this point? Minus z. Down, minus z, so this is our theta hat. At this point, this is our theta hat. Now, the n vector though, we had defined it from bottom to top. We said below the xy, we had <coughs> defined below the xy plane as the bottom, above the xy plane as the top. So this is our n vector. So basically, n hat vector is nothing but minus theta hat vector. So if you just take this relation, so this is equal to minus sigma over epsilon zero theta hat. But this tells me that sigma, well, epsilon zeros we can cancel. Sigma is equal to minus q over two pi d over r squared plus d squared. This is the surface charge density we have. Now, <clears throat> we had identified the charge densities, so we can write rho as, we have a point charge at the point dz hat, plus we have some surface charge, which is minus q over two pi, d over square root of r squared plus d squared, 
on the xy plane, let's say. Z is equal to zero. So this is our charge distribution. Another thing that we, you should note is when we evaluated the electric field at the top, you see the electric field is in the minus z hat direction. Well, theta hat is minus z hat direction. But that is perpendicular to our xy plane. So basically this is such a charge distribution that the charges are always perpendicular to the xy plane. But we had also seen that on a conductor, the charges are always perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. So in this problem, you can imagine your xy plane as a conductor. And in fact, this is the charge distribution. This is the electric field corresponding to, let's say, you have an infinite conductor. on the xy plane and you have some plus q charge at a distance d from the plane. So of course since you put some positive charge it will attract negative charges. This is a grounded conductor, not a neutral one. So it will attract negative charges and it will attract more charges at this point, which is the closest point to our charge, but less charges at this point. So the charge density you would expect to be larger at this point, smaller at this point. And yet that is actually what we had obtained. You see, this surface charge density is largest when r is equal to zero. r is equal to zero is this point over here. As you go away from this point, there are less and less charge. So this is the, where there you have the most charge. As you go away, you have less and less charge. And in fact, if, if you evaluate the total charge in this conductor, you will find that it is minus Q. How can we calculate the total charge? You see, this is the charge. This is our infinite conductor. This is the R is equal to zero point. We know the surface charge density it was Q over 2 pi D over square root of R squared plus D squared with a minus sign. How do we evaluate the total charge of this conductor? We know the surface charge density. Which area? The plate has infinite area. We, get a, um, <coughs> we determine a Gaussian surface. Gaussian surface? Not actually Gaussian surface, but we can determine a plate, I mean, part of plate, then find the charge there. And then say How do you find the charge there? How? Now that would be the easiest. You see, the charge density <coughs> depends only on r, on the, on the distance from the origin. So if you divided your sheet into very small areas, and the property of this area should be, each one of these areas should have the same r. That is basically the rings. So we have these rings. Let me draw one of them at a distance r, it, has, it would have a distance thickness dr. What is the charge of that ring? <laughs> 2 pi r dr. This is the area of the ring. What is the charge? Times Time sigma. Sigma is the total charge per area. So if this is the total area, if we multiply it by sigma, that gives me the total charge. Let's make some simplifications. The total charge will be nothing but the sum of all these dQs 
which will be minus q times d integral of r over square root of r squared plus d squared dr. And r, the smallest ring has a radius zero, and the largest ring has a radius infinite. And this will be q will be equal to minus q times d. What is the integral? R over d minus zero. Hmm? Square root of r squared plus d squared. This is the integral. Then we have a problem, though. r goes from 0 to infinity. Oops. Where did we make a mistake? Hmm? It's not just R minus, it's R minus or R, R plus cube. So here we have a cube. Here we have a cube. Hmm? You are supposed to tell me. You have the cube. Now what is the integral? Now, if you take the derivative of this one, you get uh, minus one half because of the square root in the new denominator. You get uh, twice r minus cancel this one, this two cancel the one half, so you get r over the square root cube. If you put the limits at the upper limit, it is zero. Minus at the value at the lower limit is one over d. It's minus q times d times 1 over d minus q. Well, let me change it, the notation a bit, q total. The total charge of the conductor is just minus q. So if you put some plus q charge in front of an infinite conductor, it attracts negative charges, and the total charge it attracts is equal to the charge that you put over there. Now, how do you get this electric field for this problem? We will probably start studying it next week. So at this, this, in this homework, you were given the electric field to calculate the charge distribution. Next week, you will learn how to calculate that electric field. Other questions? Well, you see, in this problem, it is, we didn't discuss what it corresponds to physically. You were supposed to discover it on your own. Now, what did we discover about R plus and R minus? Let's see, where did I write it? So this is what we had seen. So let's just plot the y and the z axis. 
So D is this point over here. Now, our, let, let's just assume this is our R position. R minus is equal to R minus D. So this is nothing but the distance between the vector position R and the position D. So this is our R minus. R plus, this was the absolute value of R plus D. Or we can write it as R minus minus D. And this is the distance between the point R and the point minus D. Well, minus D is somewhere over here. This is my R plus. But to solve this problem, you don't need to I, <coughs> realize that the R minus and R plus are these different distances. Well, I am aware that this homework contains lots of computation. Well, just take it as a foreshadowing of what is to come. You will be doing, taking lots and lots of derivatives this semester. Other questions? Okay, let's <coughs> start to study Laplace's equation a bit before you go for a break. Now, we have been discussing about this potential and the potential satisfies the Poisson's equation. This is not the Laplace's equation. This is the Poisson's equation. But let's see. Suppose we have some charge distribution over here. This is rho of r, not zero point. Everywhere else, rho can be zero. So if you consider such a volume, this is my volume V. In this volume, my potential does satisfy the Laplace's equation. At every point inside my volume, in this volume. Remember, we will be doing two things. We have the, we will, solve for potentials in, a, in certain volumes given boundary conditions. Now basically those boundary conditions will tell me what is the effect of the charge distribution that is not inside my volume. And inside my volume, if there, if there are no charges, Laplace's equation is enough for me. Now, there are a few important properties of the Laplace's equation. So let's say in one, in one dimension, del squared phi is equal to the second derivative, which is equal to zero. This tells me that phi is some function of this form, ax plus b, a and b being some constants. Now, this is what we call a linear function. It's a line in one dimension. The nice property of this line is that the value of phi at x, we can also write it as value of phi at x plus c plus the value of phi at x minus c over 2. Yeah, it's, it's, if you just Put these numbers over there, you will see that the value of the function phi at a given point x is nothing but the average of the values of the same function, same function phi at points equidistant from the point x. Well, this relation is independent of c. Whatever value of c you take, it doesn't matter. 
this relation still holds. Well, if you have a function, you have some, this function over here, which is the average of two other values that are equidistant, well, this, all, this already tells you that your function cannot have a local minimum. Because if the fun your function had a local minimum, Well, this property that the function at a given value is the average of the nearby values on both sides tells you that it cannot have a local minimum or a maximum. Let's say, let's assume, let's see why. x is equal to x0 is a minimum. Well, the same argument will hold for a maximum also. But let's just stick with the case that there is a minimum at the point x is equal to x0. Well, what, that, what this means is phi of x0 plus c is larger than phi of x0 for all values of c sufficiently small. Do you agree? If there is a local minimum, it just means that if you change your, the position where you are evaluating it, your function will increase. So if you just shift the point at which you are evaluating your function slightly from x0, its value increases. But this tells me that phi of x0 minus c plus phi of x0 plus c I just shift it in one direction or the other direction, is over 2 is larger than phi of x0 plus phi of x0 divided by 2. Why? Because x0 is a minimum. If I shift my point slightly to the left, the, my function gets a larger value. So this phi of x0 minus c is larger than phi of x0 plus this phi of x0 plus c is also larger than phi of x0. So both of these numbers, if x0 is a minimum, local minimum, both of these numbers are larger than the value of my function at x0. Again, this relation is for sufficiently small c. But this is equal to phi of x0. So if phi has a minimum at x0, that means the average of two points in the opposite sides is larger than my, than my function. But that cannot be, because I already said that my, the value of my function phi at the point x is always equal to the average of its values at two uh, symmetric points. Do you agree? It cannot have a local minimum. It cannot have a local maximum. Well, if you want to study what happens if x0 is a maximum rather than minimum, just replace all the larger than sign by smaller than signs. And the three argument is exactly the same. So at least in one dimension, the Laplace equation cannot have a local maximum or local minimum. That is the, uh, let's say, the main lesson of the story, of this example. And this property carries to all dimensions, both in two dimensions, in three dimensions. The solutions of the Laplace equation cannot have a local maximum or minimum, never. Now, in two dimensions, yes. Well, you see, in two dimensions, we have uh, more flexibility. In one dimension, it's just a line. If you go in one dimension, one direction, it increases indefinitely. If you go the other direction, it decreases indefinitely. In two dimensions, there are more possibilities. There are, uh, let's say, uh, points that we call saddle points. If you move in one, dimension, in one direction, 
it might have a local maximum, but if you move in the other direction, it should have a local minimum. So at that point, what we call the settle point is neither a maximum nor a minimum. There is such a possibility also. Well, we will be discussing this more detail in second or in the third hour, the second hour. But for example, if uh, phi doesn't have a local max, local maximum or minimum, you see, we had defined in the first year the stable points. Stable point is a point at which the potential is a minimum. Equilibrium point, sorry. An equilibrium point was a point at which the potential was a local maximum or local minimum. But this tells us that the electrostatic potential energy cannot have a local maximum or minimum. So you cannot just keep some charge at rest by configuring other charges in suitable positions. You cannot create such a stable or unstable equilibrium point. Anyway, we will continue after the break. <laughs>